California, where a number of religious people, which included Buddhist monks, Christian priests, Jewish rabbis, and indigenous Americans, that's what we used to call Red Indians, were asked to do some chanting, some praying, some form of distant healing for some people who were in hospital suffering from AIDS. The priests were given a list of names to chant for, to pray for, to do some dance for, whatever, I don't know how they did their healing. Half the names were false, half were true. In other words, half were real patients suffering from AIDS in the hospitals of California. Some were just made up. Of the, um, the target group, AIDS sufferers in the hospital, of the great group, half were being chanted for, half weren't. Half of the control group. And they gave the doctors looking after these sufferers a simple questionnaire, which was basically, in your opinion, over two weeks, has this patient improved better than expected, as expected, or less than expected? So they could actually find whether this chanting had any effects. a huge sample group. And the patients did not know they were being chanted on. The monks, the priests, the rabbis, the Indians, they didn't know whether what they were chanting on was a real person or not. But the result was so significant It was published in Time magazine where I first saw it and then I saw it in the, I got it from the internet and got the actual uh, scientific article. The chanting, the healing worked. A significant increase in the health if those people were being chanted for, paid for. It made no difference. It was a Buddhist chanting, Christian healing, indigenous Indians or Jewish ceremonies. And I mentioned this this morning because sometimes people come along and say, oh, the Christian priests say that if you believe in God, we can heal other people, but Buddhists can't. <laughs> the point is, it's scientific fact. It does not matter whether you're a Christian or a Buddhist, whoever you are, and most of us are the same. If you can think of that other person, you chant to focus the energies of your mind to wish them well, yes, it works. It's not a matter of a God. It's a matter of your power the power of your mind. You're the one who does the healing. You have that ability, you have that power, it's called loving kindness or whatever else you call it, to affect others. And they did that and they found it works. Mind to mind. Uh, I owe you an apology. I didn't clarify myself. I say uh, faith healing by touch. Uh, Faith healing by touch. Even... (laughs) Even the fact that somebody cares for you, when it's actually so direct, there's so many other possibility, possible explanations. Just the fact that, you know, that somebody cares for you with touch, whenever anyone touches you gently, that by itself is therapeutic. It doesn't matter, no powers, but just, you know, the human body warms to touch. It warms because that settles you. Remember when you were a kid, your mother would touch you? I remember when I was a child, if I, you know, playing soccer in the streets, because it was a poor part of London, you sometimes play in the streets, you'd fall over and you'd, you know, uh, scrape the skin off your knee. And as a six or seven year old, you'd go crying to your mother, Mom! And all she would do, she'd bend down and kiss it. Put all the germs of her mouth on the open wound. <laughs> I only found that out afterwards, but it worked. As soon as she did that, the pain went away, the whole thing healed up. That was faith healing. Because I had faith in my mum. <laughs> so yeah, it can work on so many different levels. Is there some intervention by the Deva? Because I've known a person, mm. when he touches or when she touches you, you feel uh, heat going through your body. Yeah. How do you explain that? That's the energy from her. Her own energy. It's Reiki energy, I was told. Yeah, <laughs> Reiki energy. But a lot of times people think it's from Devas, but it's from your own energies, your own mind. People have a huge amount of power in their mind, they just don't use it, that's all. Because we don't know how to. Our mind's all over the place. Think about this, think about that, always complaining, using up our energies. We've got a huge amount of power. If you can only focus it, 
Those people who have been meditating sometimes can feel that power. This is one experiment which I'm going to do tomorrow morning. I'll let you know this in advance. We've been doing a loving kindness meditation just about it was after the chanting, maybe 5.45. Tomorrow morning, somewhere during the loving kindness meditation, I'm going to ask you to think very strongly of a loved one. Spend lots of loving kindness to them. Really put heaps of kindness and care for them. And when we're in the middle of that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to look at my clock and I'm going to tell you what the time is. I may even write it down myself. And then, when you go home tomorrow evening or when you next see that person, I want you to ask them, if you don't mind me asking, what were you doing at, say, 6 o'clock on Sunday morning? If they were sleeping, they'd say, that's funny, I was dreaming of you. (laughs) If they're awake, they'd say, I was thinking of you. I've done this many times. It's incredible how well it works. And actually, the reason I do this is actually just to give people confidence and faith that, yeah, they can influence somebody. You can actually take a loved one, I can get you really strong in your loving kindness, and I'd give you the time, You check it out afterwards. Yeah, at that time, they were thinking they felt good. Many times that's happened. And you can do it yourself to actually prove it. It's your energy. Thank you very much, Ajahn Brahm. Very good. Be very patient with me. May you always be happy and well. (laughs) (laughs) Always. It doesn't give me much freedom. Can't I be miserable from time to time? No, come on. Yes. This afternoon oh, okay. when I was, I was doing right. walking meditation in front of the stage, suddenly my energy, the chi was getting hard and my fingers was pricking hard. Then I realized that I was passing you. I realized that God's energy was so strong. Does it have healing effect? There we go, that proves it. <laughs> <laughs> now she said she got some energy, a burst of energy for me. There are energy places in this world and they're built up by people. I mentioned to many of you about that six months when I spent in my hut in Australia alone, not speaking to anybody, not seeing anyone for six months. I said this, I think, in the question time, so people in the back haven't heard this story. After the six months was completed, of all that energy in that hut, great samadhi energy, the fellow monks in my monastery, I found out later, were wheeling and dealing, trying to be the next person to sit in that hut to get a buzz from that energy to help with their own meditation. And the monk who actually managed to get that hut after I left, he said, he went down there, he couldn't go in. The energy was just too strong for him. And this was a monk. He was a German monk, been a monk for many years. He was actually, he was one of the monks from Mitrigala. He said, ooh, it was too much. (laughs) Yeah, there is such a thing as energy. And you've got it. Not just monks. So make use of it. You had a question? You're saying, we do the metta tomorrow, can we do our departed loved ones? If it's departed loved ones, you can't, go, can't really go and ask them at that time. <laughs> what were you thinking? But, of course, you can do love, departed loved ones with loving kindness. We can do that inside or at the end of the meditation. You can do that. Do with someone who's senile. Sometimes people who are senile, they have these moments of clarity. Sometimes that moment might be a moment they're extra clear. Give it a try. I love experimenting with things you're not supposed to do. Senile people aren't supposed to be able to feel this. Give it a try. Who knows? They may actually be acting on a different level, not just on their brain, upon their mind. The brain may be seen now, but never the mind. Underneath all of that is a strong mind. Give it a try. Any other questions? Yes, please come to the, the microphone. And if you, because there's only a few minutes left, you have, maybe have to queue up at the microphone. Hi, Brown. Rush there, otherwise you may not get there. Yes, hello, how are you? 
Hi, thank you. I'm Very fine. Good. Very good. I've got a, a slight problem with um, trying to get my brains around this concept of anatta, which I was following Very good. the, uh, the uh, uh, talk last night. Yeah. Uh, if I may relate a, a personal experience, uh, which is why it's, it's giving me problems. Um, many, many years ago, when I was a student in Leeds, um, I had a what I thought must be an out-of-body experience. However, um, I wasn't on drugs. Uh, <laughs> I, I was, I think, in the middle of an exam. And um, for many, many nights, uh, three or four nights, I was having this feeling of the, the soul, I thought, trying to come out. And uh, it was a great fear. And on the fourth night, I gave up. I thought, let's see where it can go. So it comes out. I was hovering around in, uh, in the bedroom, seeing my own body. And then I, I was scared of heights. But still, I thought, let it go. And whoosh, it went out the window. Went up and down the street. I can see the post office, the fish and chip shop. And uh, after hovering for a while, I came back in. And I thought, hmm, that was a fun experience. So I tried it again the next few nights. And... Uh, Eventually, it stopped when a, a mate of mine told me, uh, try eating some salt. And sure enough, it stopped. My question is, in the, in, in the context of anatta, non-self, no-soul, how does, is that a stream of consciousness? Or if it's a stream of consciousness, does it need to have a vehicle to travel on, which is, I thought, up to now, the soul? Okay, very good question. Actually, if you were doing that just before the exams, you should have sent your astral body to the examination room to look at the, <laughs> look at the exam papers and come back again. That would save you a lot of, a lot of trouble. <laughs> they would not have known you were there. <laughs> but no, it is what the Buddha called a manamayakaya, the mind-made body, so this is actually similar to what happens to you when you die, floating above your body. And you find it's interesting, the Buddha was very precise, he said, it's just like you take a reed, like a piece of grass, out from its sheath. So you look exactly the same as the body lying down there. Even to the point, if you were wearing those clothes on your bed, you'd be wearing those clothes in this mind-made body. You had a beard, you hadn't shaved before you sort of you know, left your body your mind-made body would need shaving as well. Basically, exact replica. I don't know exactly why that is, but the Buddha noticed that and said that. But that is the stream of consciousness. In other words, it's not a soul. The difference, it's not that much different than a soul, as far as you're concerned. But watch, the way it is really different is that that stream of consciousness, what people think is a soul, is actually always changing. In other words, there's nothing in that experience which is always was there at the beginning, which is there at the end. The simile which is usually given from our experience from nature is a river. If you look at the river, the Klang River yesterday, it looks exactly the same as today. Sometimes if you don't look deeply enough, you think there's nothing changed. That's why it has an identity. We call it the Klang River. We think it's the same that stream of consciousness which you observed, which was a real experience, many people have that, it was a real experience, but the whole process was changing every moment. It progressed, it was a process, not a thing. That's the only difference between, say, Hinduism and Buddhism. Yeah, we have this rebirth process, and it appears the same for most people. But as Buddhists with a powerful mind, superpower mind, because you can look in that and you can see its particular nature. The other simile I gave yesterday was a simile of a, a beach. A stretch of sand looks continuous. But if you look at upon it with greater detail, you find it's just particles of silica of sand with gaps between it. That whole experience, if you could look upon it with greater mindfulness, is it's one conscious moment with a gap and then another conscious moment strung together just like the old movies the silent movies which you may even see these days were just frames 
still frames moving so fast you could not realize there were still frames. It gave the illusion of continuity of movement. Similar to your experience. So is that equivalent to uh, hallucination? No, 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 this is real, absolutely real. You weren't hallucinating, that was real. People have done this, they've done little experiments, like they've got their, fr- they've got their friends to get like a roulette wheel or something and to twirl it above before you go to sleep so you can't see where that ball landed. Get you to actually to, uh, in your astral body, to go out there, see which number the ball has gone on to, and then check it out in the morning. If it's true, it's real. People have done that. Thank you. So it's real experience, not hallucination. Ajahn, yeah. uh, with science, we found that uh, matter is actually composing of atoms. And uh, matter is actually composed of atoms. And, matter? Uh, things, form, it's all form, form. Yeah. actually are composed of uh, atoms. And within these atoms, there is actually a lot of void, emptiness. So, uh, is it that when uh, in, in Samadhi, with, with this, uh, uh, in, in the stage of Samadhi, the person actually begins to see that na- nature of things, the common factor that links all forms or link all things in, in life, which is actually, actually that emptiness, that void. So, an uh, enlightened being, actually, is just, he has begun to uncondition his mind. He can see things from a different perspective. It's just like uh, these 3D pictures that we have, which, if we just see it like that, it's just a mess of pictures. Yeah? Uh, it's just like a, a, a graffiti. But if we look closer from a different perspective, a three-dimensional picture pops out. So, is it the same in terms of a concept? It's interesting because I was a scientist, before a physicist before I was a monk. And one of the great um, parts of physics which really impressed me was quantum theory. And because quantum physics was one of the first parts of science where you needed a mind, it came out from the equations. And it wasn't just atoms with holes in it. In fact, atoms had no existence apart from an observer. For those of you who've done such science, you know that there was a scientist called Erwin Schrödinger. And now he's well known as the Schrödinger equation. It was the best, um, and when I was at, uh, doing quantum physics, it was the best explanation of actually for sub, uh, sub-particle physics, such as atoms. What it actually showed that there's no such thing as an atom with a hole. It's just a spread of probability. It's like a smudge of matter which extends to every edge of the known universe. It's only more probable in some places than others. But until you make an observation, it's not meaningful to say an atom is located anywhere or it has any extent or any holes or anything. It's a smudge of probability. When you have an observation, when a mind gets involved, the term they use in science was it collapses the Schrodinger equation to give an observable event. But even that observable event is uncertain. The famous Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And that was actually meaningful because... Schrodinger also gave his name to this wonderful thought experiment which became known as Schrodinger's cat. Now Schrodinger wasn't a Buddhist. He would not have thought of this if he was. The point of his thought experiment, he said, you can put a cat in a closed box. In that box was an ampule of cyanide. That cyanide would break if an atom would would, um, decay. The decay of atoms, a radioactive process, is a quantum process. He said you could arrange things so there's a 50-50 chance in 10 minutes that that cyanide capsule would break and kill the cat. He said because it's a quantum process, 
the actual reality which beggars believe but it is true the truth according to science every experiment proves this is absolutely true this is real not hallucination the truth is that until you open that box the cat is not dead 